Hey, that's Porter, the new SB2C. Now, I wonder how he likes it. He's coming in now. Let's wait for him and find out. I want to ask him some questions anyhow. Hi, fellas. Nothing to do? Yeah, but we're waiting for you. For me? Yeah, we want to get some dope on that new hell diver you just took him. Okay, fire. Ask the professor anything. I'll try to answer. Well, in that last dive you just made, you seem to be moving pretty fast. How about it? Well, no. That engine and the air blast make a lot of noise, but I wasn't diving so fast. The dive flaps take care of that. Tell you what, if you guys really want to know, I'll show you some of the features of the plane. Yeah, I'd like to get a check out on it. Okay, let's have a look. There's one being taken out to the line now. That's it, gents. A hell diver, sometimes called the SB-2C. She's a scout and a dive bomber, and can deliver depth bombs or a torpedo as well. And this baby's at home with land-based squadrons or on aircraft carriers. She's powered with a right cyclone engine, delivering 1,700 brake horsepower at takeoff. Empty, it has a gross weight of 10,114 pounds. 16,607 with maximum bomb loadings, or 16,812 pounds when carrying a torpedo. Her bomb load is carried inside the fuselage and may consist of two 500-pound general purpose bombs or two 1,000-pound armor-piercing bombs, or a single bomb which may weigh up to 1,600 pounds. And with bomb doors removed, a 2,000-pound torpedo may be carried on a truss structure externally. Notice the widely spaced wheels. They give good stability and directional control on the ground, and the oleos are sturdy and rugged to take the punishment of rough carrier landings. This area, which takes a beating from rough carrier landings, has been structurally reinforced with a heavier gauge skin and with strengthened internal framework. For normal operations, a fuel capacity of 320 gallons may be carried in the three tanks, all of which meet requirements for all maneuvers. 110 gallons in the fuselage and 105 in each of the wings. An auxiliary droppable bomb bay tank of 130 gallons capacity can be carried for long scouting missions. And in addition, two 58 gallon droppable tanks can be hung from the wing bomb racks. Boy, you're gonna really throw in a load of fuel for scouting missions. Let's see, that's 320, 130, 58 times two makes a total of 566 gallons. Yeah, but you ought to see some of the other things. Here, let's watch these guys get her ready to go. The starting procedure the ground crew is about to go through has been found by test to be the best possible for the plane. It works well in temperatures down to 30 degrees Fahrenheit without oil dilution. Below that, oil dilution is necessary. When they're about to start the engine, signals are exchanged to be sure that automatic pilot, ignition, and starter switches are in the off position. Mixture control should be at idle cutoff. Throttle is set for 1200 RPM. Check to be sure the landing gear control is locked in the down position. Then if the engine has been idle for an hour or more, the prop is pulled through three or four revs to clear the combustion chamber. Cowl flaps are set to full open position. Fuel selector valve on fuselage. Propeller switches on and automatic. Prop control down for full increase. Carburetor air, direct. Primer breaker on. And fuel gauge on. Battery, on. Generator, on. Starter breaker switch, on. Ignition switch, both. The electric inertia starter is put on and held in operation for about 15 or 20 seconds. Fuel pressure of six to seven pounds is obtained by means of the auxiliary electric fuel pump. And the electric primer pump switch is held on from one to three seconds, depending on outside temperature. Then the mixture control is set at full rich. 
When the all clear signal has been given, the meshing switch is held on until the engine starts. If the engine is cold, it may be necessary to use the primer a few times to keep the engine operating. Now get this, it's important. Do not touch the throttle during the starting procedure. Leave it set at 1200 RPM until the engine is running smoothly. If the engine is over primed, move throttle to full open. Mixture control to idle cutoff and the ignition switch off. Then by hand, rotate the prop three or four revs and repeat the starting procedure. When the engine is firing smoothly, allow it to warm up at 1200 RPM with prop set in low pitch until the oil inlet temperature reaches 55 degrees centigrade and cylinder head temperature at least 130 degrees centigrade. Engine oil pressure should reach 40 pounds within 30 seconds after starting. If required pressure fails to develop, stop the engine immediately and investigate. The wings are spread hydraulically by turning the control handle counterclockwise and holding it. This is the first U.S. Navy dive bomber equipped with hydraulic folding wings. Depending upon the wind, these wings can unfold in 30 seconds because of larger hydraulic cylinders. When the wings are fully extended, the control handle is pushed full forward to lock the wings in place. When they are safely locked, the flag indicators on the wings will have receded until they are flush with the surface. Slats are provided on the leading edge of the wings to smooth out the airflow over the ailerons at high angles of attack. These slats open when the landing gear is extended. They close when the gear is retracted and have no independent control. It is imperative that the pilot's shoulder harness be secured and adjusted as soon as he mans the airplane. And it must remain fastened at all times especially when making a carrier landing, to help prevent head or face injuries in case of a barrier crash. The pilot's seat may be raised or lowered as necessary to give proper vision through the reflector sight above the instrument panel. Adjustments are provided on the rudder and brake pedals to suit the pilot's size and give him full positive control. Rudder pedals are adjusted by kicking out the ratchet release on the inboard side and moving the pedals to the desired position. Be sure that each pedal is ratcheted backward or forward the same number of notches. You should also check to make sure that hydraulic valves number one and number two are fully open and that both number three valves are fully closed. The hydraulic system pressure gauge should read approximately 1,000 pounds. When the engine is thoroughly warmed up, the throttle is advanced until the manifold pressure is 30 inches giving less than 2,000 RPM. Then check your magnetos by moving the switch so as to operate the engine, first on one mag and then on the other. Hold the switch momentarily at full as you move it to check each mag individually. Normal drop on one mag is 75 to 100 RPM. More than this will indicate bad magnetos or spark plugs and should be investigated. Check the ammeter to be sure the generator is charging and don't leave the line unless it is. Now check the two-speed supercharger at an engine speed of 1700 RPM and not more than 25 inches manifold pressure. Move the supercharger control lever quickly to high and wait for increased manifold pressure to stabilize. Then return the control lever to low. If a sudden drop in manifold pressure occurs, the supercharger mechanism is operating properly. Check functioning of the constant speed propeller at a steady throttle setting of 1900 RPM. Move the prop switch to decrease and hold until the tack shows a drop of about 200 RPM. Then switch to increase and hold until original speed is regained. Finally, place the prop switch in the automatic position. Move the prop governor control up 
to give a decrease of about 200 RPM. Then we turn it to full down to give 1900 RPM. Before leaving the line, make one last check. The operation of your flaps. First the landing and then the dive flaps. Remember, however, under no circumstances should you move the flap selector lever when the flaps are in any condition other than fully closed. As you taxi out to your takeoff runway, you'll notice what good visibility you have from the cockpit. Also notice that the rudder is effective for directional control, unless the plane is allowed to swing excessively. Use your brakes sparingly. They're power operated, which means that the amount of braking action obtained is determined by the length of time the brake pedal is depressed, not by the amount of pressure applied. On sharp turns, try to keep the inside wheel moving a little to avoid scrubbing off the tread. Turn the checkoff switch to bring the takeoff list into view and go through it carefully, item by item. Fuel selector valve, on fuselage. Auxiliary fuel pump, on. Mixture control, automatic rich. Carburetor air heat control, full coal. Supercharger control, Locked in low. Prop control, automatic. And governor control set for low pitch. Cowl flaps, about one third open. Rudder tab, seven units right. Aileron tab, neutral. Elevator tab, normally neutral, but this will vary slightly with the loading of the plane. Tailwheel locked. Hood sections locked open. If the airplane is carrying a reasonably light load, the takeoff may be made with flaps up, as in this case. You'll need 44 and one half inches of manifold pressure and 2800 RPM for takeoff. When you're sure you have it, release the brakes and start your takeoff run. Prompt rudder action will correct any tendency of the plane to swerve during the early stages of the run. The tail will lift to the speed of approximately 55 knots, and at close to 80 knots, the airplane will fly herself off. Hey, that doesn't seem like such a tough baby to fly. That's for me. I like to try it up myself. Well, the only tricky detail is in the starting procedure. Some pilots say that they've had trouble in starting the engine but that's only because they don't follow the right starting procedure. A priming should be done immediately prior to meshing the starter, and if necessary, while the engine's being turned over. What about carrier takeoffs? How is she for that? It's just as easy with the flaps down. Look, this is a takeoff with flaps down 25 degrees for the full distance of the run. Although on a real carrier, 45 degrees is recommended. The same for landing and catapulting. The flap selector lever is checked in the down position and the flap control lever is held in the extended position until the flap angle indicator shows the desired number of degrees. Then the control lever is placed in neutral to hold the flaps in position. When flaps are used for takeoff, the elevator tab should be trimmed one half a unit nose down for a light load and about one unit down for a heavy load. Your takeoff run will be somewhat shorter due to the increased lift of the flaps. Again, the tail will lift at about 55 knots, and the getaway speed will be close to 75 knots. As soon as you're safely airborne, retract the landing gear. To do this, the safety lever alongside the landing gear control is unlocked and after depressing the locking button on top of the control, the lever is moved to the up position. The slats will close as the landing gear is retracted. When you have an altitude of at least 325 feet and an indicated airspeed of not less than 97 knots, bring up the flaps. 
You can overcome any tendency of the plane to mush as the flaps retract by bringing them up gradually, a step at a time, like this. As soon as possible after the takeoff, reduce manifold pressure to 35 inches and set prop control to give 2400 RPM, using vernier if necessary for close adjustment. As you climb away from the field, be sure your mixture control is in automatic rich and keep a close watch on cylinder head temperature. If the temperature goes above 230 degrees, open the cowl flaps for additional cooling. They create some buffeting at full open and have a high drag, so keep them not more than half open if possible. If head temperature continues to rise, reduce RPM or nose down to increase your airspeed. Never exceed 248 degrees centigrade under any condition. The best climbing speed varies from 140 knots indicated at sea level to 120 knots at 23,000 feet. For climbing at normal rated horsepower at sea level, you'll be turning 2400 RPM with 42 and one half inches of manifold pressure. As you climb, this reading will decrease if the throttle is kept in the same position. And at an altitude of 9,500 feet, you will be able to get only 34 inches of mercury at full throttle. If you must continue climbing, retard the throttle slightly, then shift quickly from low to high supercharger. This will enable you to get 40 inches of manifold pressure at 2,400 RPM up to an altitude of about 14,000 feet. For cruising at 65% power, you can rev at 2,050 RPM and carry 28 inches of manifold pressure in low blower up to 9,000 feet and 2,230 RPM with 26 and a half inches in high blower at service ceiling. Always shift the mixture control to automatic lean for maximum cruise operation, as well as for cruising at 60% of rated power on long scouting missions, where the prime consideration is fuel economy. This airplane is not as stable as most about the longitudinal axis and cannot be balanced to fly entirely hands off. However, very little movement of the stick is required to keep her in the desired attitude. Now about the stall characteristics of the hell diver. First, in the clean condition and with power off. The plane becomes left wing heavy and at close to 80 knots, she stalls and rolls to the left. If recovery is made promptly, there is little tendency to spiral, dive, or spin. However, if the stall is permitted to go beyond its initial stage, as in this demonstration, the airplane will roll as much as 60 degrees to the left and go into a spiral dive. Recovery from this situation is slower, but otherwise entirely normal. In a power off stall with flaps down 30 degrees, as in this demonstration, the stalling speed is close to 75 knots. Again, the tendency to fall off to the left is characteristic, but recovery is prompt and normal, unless the stall is held beyond its initial stages. Then the roll will be more pronounced, followed by a spiral dive. With flaps down 45 degrees and power off, the stalling speed will be about 70 knots. And with full flaps, as seen here, the plane will stall at around 65 knots. However, she will squash very rapidly with full flaps and high engine power will be required to keep altitude. Order, my boy, that plane looks good to me. I'll buy half a dozen. Now, what about her speed? I mean, can she keep up with a fighter escort? Speed? Brother, that's the fastest dive bomber this man's Navy has ever seen. Top speed of around 310 and cruises around 200. This hell diver can travel in fast company. And you know what that means in terms of fighter protection. Here, watch this now. 
Dive bombing is the Hell Diver's chief offensive mission, and the technique of handling this airplane in dives is extremely important. Before entering a dive, these preparations should be made. Hood locked open. Check your landing gear. If they're locked up, these lights will go on. Fuel selector valve on the tank with the most fuel. Mixture control, automatic rich. Propeller, cruise RPM, plus or minus 100. Throttle, set for manifold pressure of not more than 20 inches. Cowl flaps, closed. Bomb bay doors, open. Rudder tab, zero. To open the split diving flaps, the flap selector lever is moved to the up position. Then the flap control lever is moved from the closed to the extended position. This works hydraulically and the flap response is instantaneous. Indicated airspeed is less than 212 knots. Placing the flap control lever in neutral will hold the diving flaps where you want them. This airplane is steady in the dive and can be rolled easily with the ailerons to stay on the target. Terminal velocity will be about 300 knots at the end of a 10,000 foot dive. Recovery from the dive is made easily with a normal pullback on the stick. Avoid abrupt bullets, which impose undue strains on the airplane. The Hell Diver does all the usual acrobatic maneuvers. Its speed restrictions are according to current technical orders. Loops, such as this one, may be entered at a speed of 215 knots. The slow roll performed at a starting speed of 195 knots. The Immelman executed at a starting speed of 243 knots. The Chandel entered at a speed of 205 knots. The Loon over while flying at a speed of 173 knots. The vertical bank performed at 170 knots. Before our performing hell diver comes in for a normal landing, let's have a look at some of the emergency safeguards provided for the primary hydraulic system, which operates the landing gear, flaps, and brakes. If hydraulic system pressure falls off to a point insufficient for extending the landing gear, check flap control lever in neutral and landing gear control lever in up position. This may serve to restore pressure in the primary system and when you have 800 to 1,000 pounds indicated, the landing gear, brakes, and flaps may be operated in the usual manner. If no pressure develops, close shutoff valve number two. Leave flap control in neutral. 
and put landing gear control in down position. Then operate the hand hydraulic pump until the landing gear indicators on the wings show that the gear is down and locked in position. The hand pump also will provide pressure for lowering your flaps. After you've landed, the brake accumulator will furnish pressure for 10 to 12 applications of the brakes. After which, the hand pump must be used if further braking is desired. If both these methods fail, open both number three hydraulic valves. This will permit the landing gear to extend by gravity in from two to five minutes. As the gear slowly extends, roll the plane smartly to help engage the locking pins. When the wing indicator flags come into view, you'll know that the gear is down and locked. This will give you wheels to land on, but you can't lower your flaps. However, the brake accumulator will furnish braking power. These optional emergency procedures inherent in the primary hydraulic system are vital to safe piloting of this airplane. Familiarize yourself with the operation of this hydraulic system and the various methods of controlling it. Then you'll be able to handle emergencies with confidence and certainty. As you come into the field for a normal landing, be careful to observe existing traffic regulations. When you've announced your presence and requested landing instructions, turn to your checkoff list and follow it, item by item. Tail wheel locked. Fuel on best tank. Supercharger low. Mixture control automatic rich. Propeller governor set for 2400 RPM. Propeller push button switch in automatic. Landing gear down and locked. Landing flaps down, but not until indicated airspeed is below 133 knots. Carburetor air direct. Sliding enclosures locked open. As you approach the runway, throttle back to about 90 knots. And you can set her down nicely on three points. The brakes are very powerful and have a decided effect, so use them smoothly during the run to keep control of the plane and slow it down. For a field carrier landing such as this, you'll use the normal landing checkoff list. But if you were coming into a real flat top, you'd also unstrap your parachute and put down the landing hook. You should make your approach for this type of landing at about 85 knots, slowing down to around 75 knots as you're over the mat. Keep your eyes on the signal officer, not the airspeed indicator. This time you'll be coming in at almost a stalling attitude. Cut the throttle the instant you get the signal and land normally. After slowing to taxi speed, pick up your wing flaps, open the cowl flaps, and unlock the tail wheel. Take it easy as you taxi back to the line. Give your engine a chance to cool by not revving more than 1200 RPM. When you've maneuvered into your parking spot on the apron and are ready to shut down the engine, Idle at 600 to 800 RPM until the cylinder head temperature is at least 150 degrees centigrade. Then advance the throttle to get 1000 RPM and hold for half a minute to permit optimum scavenging of oil from the engine. Move the mixture control to idle cutoff position. And as soon as the prop stops turning, turn off the ignition switch. Close the fuel selector valve and cut all other operating switches before you leave the airplane. I'm going out and have a closer look at that plane. Anybody coming? Uh, good idea. Okay, come on. There are a couple of other features I want to show you, and since you've come this far, you might as well know the rest. See this? It's a new strong horizontal stabilizer, specially designed for a 15,000 pound load. But it's been statically tested to 21,000 pounds. Nothing you'll ever have to do with this plane will make that tail flutter. It's really rugged. Hey, fellas, look. Yep, that's a metal upper surface. Gives a great deal more strength at high speeds. Engineers say it's a darn good thing. How about this, Professor? That's a handy little improvement intended to make your job less fatiguing. It's called a mid-span aileron balance tab. 
Here, let me show you what it does. Now watch what happens when I move the stick or a bank to the right. When the control actuates the aileron, it also actuates this tab, which lowers into the slipstream and exerts additional lifting force on the aileron. I get it. This helps pull the aileron up and makes less work for the pilot. That's right. And it works in the same fashion when the stick is moved the other way. You'll notice the benefits of this after a long flight. Less fatigue. Take a look at the dive flap down there. When they're retracted, they're a smooth part of the wing surface. They don't affect the aerodynamic characteristics of the wing adversely. Yet when they're extended in a dive along with the landing flaps, they really slow the plane down, make for bombing accuracy and an easy pullout. Well, that's about all there is now. Of course, there's a lot more I could tell you, but you should take her up and find out for yourself. Boy, I'm going to as soon as I can. You fooled me. Well, I haven't been trying to sell you the plane, although I think it's a darn good plane myself. But I did want to show you that it's sound and dependable. It's got flight characteristics that make it equally effective as a scout, a dive bomber, or a torpedo plane. A combination like that makes it a good airplane to have in the fleet. Any guy who flies it properly has a mighty deadly weapon on his side. the Atlantic seaboard one fine morning in 1943, an imposing force of American naval air power proceeds to an important rendezvous. This force is the aircraft complement of a new carrier, fighters, dive bombers, torpedo bombers. With the air group commander leading everyone, they are flying out to sea to join the ship which will be their floating home and fighting base is one of many carriers which the American people have built since Pearl Harbor to destroy the enemy in his own part of the world far away. And there now is our base, powerful and serene. In honor of all American aircraft carriers, let us call her the Fighting Lady. Against a good solid wind with their tail hooks down, our planes come into the broad flight deck of their new home. In case the plane's hook fails to catch the arresting gear, there's a series of stout wire barriers. Number one man on the flight deck just now is the LSO, the landing signal officer, always a flyer himself. Like all aviators, he'd much rather be flying. Come on in and sit down. The plane is out of the groove and he waves it off. Come around another time, pilot, and we'll take you aboard.
When planes land, they taxi quickly forward out of the way. Later, they'll have to be shifted to the stern and rearranged in proper position for takeoff. This is called respotting the deck. Here is our skipper, Jocko, a veteran Navy flyer, Annapolis 1917. He is not impressed by our earnest efforts or the flight deck control officers. The skipper calls all hands together and gives us a piece of his mind. We'll never be ready for combat unless you flight deck crews learn right now to work as a team. Don't you men realize that before long we'll be in dangerous waters? That's too slow! Bear a hand! Watch out! Keep that wing clear! Get it over to starboard! Way over to starboard! Come on, get the lead out of your pants! Now this is the way your deck should look when you're ready for action. Our ship, our fighting lady, is enormous, wonderful, and strange to us. From stem to stern, the entire ship is a honeycomb of watertight and flame-proof compartments. Far below the waterline are engine rooms, fire rooms, fuel tanks, magazines packed with enough assorted high explosive to blow us all to kingdom come. The hangar deck is like a gigantic tunnel, nearly two city blocks long and wide enough to house four freight trains abreast. It'll take us a week, a month maybe, to learn our way around. These new surroundings are as mysterious to us as they are cold and impersonal. Our fighting lady is like a huge floating cave, noisy and uncomfortable. Elevators as big as a tennis court carry us topside to the flight deck. The great superstructure rising amidships is called the island. This is truly the ship's nerve center, its fighting brain. 85% of us who make up the fighting ladies' family are volunteers in this war and never been to sea before. We learned our jobs theoretically in intensive training ashore. A very short while ago, we were high school boys and college kids or bank clerks or farm hands or factory workers. Now we are blue jackets and marines, all members of a naval combat team nearly 3,000 strong. In our multitude of new tasks and duties as a team, we're very green, but curiosity and comradeship and the instinct of self-preservation are great teachers. Some of us have to master the delicate and complicated instruments which control the fire of our five-inch batteries, the guns that must defend the fighting lady when enemy dive bombers and torpedo planes attack. We train and train to learn our stuff and earn our E for efficiency. The fighting lady's destination is still a closely guarded secret. But no one can hide the fact that we are entering tropical waters. Our ship seems more friendly and comfortable now. We greenhorns feel that a suntan will at least make us look like fighting sailors. Even our mascot, Scrappy, has been at sea longer than most of us. Some of the mystery that has been hanging over us is lifted when we enter the Panama Canal. There is a lot of unprofessional nervousness about whether or not we're too big to get through the locks. By using lines instead of fenders, we do get through, as the naval constructors knew all along we would. Come on, hop aboard. We're going places. For two cents, I would. Do anybody want to swap? Now we stand out into the Pacific, and life aboard settles down into monotony. Here are our aircraft pilots, officers all. 
Ship's company call them the Glamour Boys. They are the men who fly and fight our planes. All the efforts of all the rest of us are concentrated on putting these people into the air and getting them back again. Most of us are hiding a certain amount of nervousness and anxiety, for many of us are Johnny-come-latelys, reserve officers who only recently learned to fly at Corpus Christi in Jacksonville. Others among us are specialists who trained at Quonset Point, Rhode Island. Reserves are called by the regulars, in a friendly way, 90-day wonders. In return, the Annapolis regulars are called the trade school boys. But whether Quonset or Annapolis, all are bound together in the fraternity, the close fellowship of Navy men. Among the ship's non-commissioned personnel, almost 3,000 Blue Jackets and 100 Marines, the hottest shots are the air crewmen, aerial gunners and radio men. These boys and the plane captains are the partners of the Glamour Boys in the air. By non-flying Blue Jackets, they are called Zoom Pigeons or Airedales. And because they receive 50% extra pay for flying, they are sometimes referred to as the Bankroll Boys. Everybody aboard ship backs up the flying group. This requires the efforts of all manner of people. Many of the jobs are far from glamorous. All the little tasks and services you find along Main Street must be performed by some members of our carrier's crew. For though the fighting lady is a powerful ship of war, she is also a sizable American community. Its population must be supplied with all the necessities and some of the comforts of home. Doc Sorensen, the pharmacist mate, is just like a village druggist. Next door is our hospital called Sick Bay. It has only a few patients now, but soon it is to be filled with our wounded. Men like these who perform the humble jobs that make life aboard a fighting carrier more bearable, the barbers and the cobblers, are seldom mentioned in communiques. They all have a place in our fighting team. Weeks pass. Now we are far out into the Pacific, which is a very considerable body of water. Monotony shuts down on us between our duties. Guessing where we're bound is still our chief pastime. Will we put into Pearl? Are we going to Iron Bottom Bay? Or maybe even to the Aleutians? All such gossip and rumor are called scuttlebutt or drinking fountain conversation. Throughout the ship, men get together in little groups to take refuge from the heavy burden of waiting for something to happen. And then one day out of nowhere comes a fast fleet tanker and we're refueled at sea. This tells us something. This tells us that we are not going to Pearl or any other land base for a long, long time. Besides our skipper, we have an admiral aboard, a sea dog who's been a naval flyer for nearly 20 years. Until now, only these officers have known where we are to go. But now Jocko, our captain, confers with the air group commander and reveals the plan. The fighting lady has been ordered to make a strike. She will pass through waters where no carrier task force has ventured since the bloody Battle of Midway. Remember, this is 1943, long before we took the Marshall Islands. Weather studies are made, and though this is a daily routine, somehow the whole ship senses that something is about to happen. Even before the news is broadcast to all of us, there's a new tension and atmosphere of expectancy. And then we are told, we have traveled more than 7,000 miles from Panama so that tomorrow, August 30th, 1943, we can strike the Jap base at Marcus Island, deep within the enemy's ring of defenses. 
The evening before our first strike, the air group commander briefs all his pilots with maps and a model of our target. We are sticking out our necks to within a thousand miles of Tokyo to divert the Japs' attention from other American activities far south and east of Marcus. Those of us who have never before been in battle, that's most of us, ask a lot of questions of those who have seen action. Seat gunners, don't break off until you're practically on the same course and right astern of the enemy. Then push over fast. Outwardly, we try to seem composed and cheerful, but a lot's going on inside our minds. We question our most inner selves. What'll it be like? How'll we take it? Will we do all right? This is the night when a lot of boys write one more letter home. Among those playing AC Ducey in the ward room is a chubby 23-year-old from Eureka Springs, Arkansas, Lieutenant E.T. Stover, nicknamed Smokey. That's he sitting on the far right. Having flown 50 missions at Guadalcanal, Smokey has been ordered to take a rest. He'd much rather be flying. Before dark on the eve of battle, our planes are loaded with bombs and gas. So that each plane will be in its precise position for a speedy takeoff, we spot and respot our deck. Now all is perfect. We will strike at dawn. And now GQ, General Quarters. Every man on the ship goes to his battle station, his special place on the fighting team. George, the barber, will pass ammunition. Leo, the baker, will be a sky lookout. Frank, the tailor, is assigned to a first aid station. Pilots are in their ready rooms. Each squadron, fighter, bomber, torpedo bomber, assemble separately. Flyers get into their flight gear and receive last minute data and instructions. On the flight deck, our first battle dawn awaits us. Our whole ship is on hair trigger. The fighting lady is hardly 100 miles from the first target of her career. These last few minutes before the order for our first action are the toughest time of all. A wise man once said, War is mostly waiting. We learn now what that can mean. At last the word comes. Pilots, man your planes. Ready room three, roger. Pilots, man your planes. Fighters take off first to form cover aloft for the other squadrons. Then the bombers, heavy laden with destruction. The sun has risen now and our escorts are alert for enemy submarines. But the fighting lady steams boldly toward our target to lessen the distance for our planes when they return. The radio plotting room is the electric eye and ear by which the fighting lady detects and keeps tab on all planes and ships for miles around us. Smokey, the fighting ace from Arkansas, has been put in charge of this room for our big day. 
Punched among his assistants, Smokey is like a super quarterback on a super football team. He is in constant touch with our entire air group. As our first fighters race in toward Marcus Island, they stay low, hoping to escape detection by the enemy's radar. Then they climb suddenly and dive, a surprise strafing attack on the enemy's airstrips. These red balls floating up at us so lazily are anti-aircraft fire. There is three times as much of it coming up at us as we can see, because only one shell in three is a tracer. What look like fiery polywogs are tracers from our own wing guns. The ak is much heavier than expected, but through it we go to knock out enemy bombers on the ground. All through these battle pictures realize that we are looking straight down our own gun barrels. These pictures are taken automatically by the same mechanism that operates the guns. Pictures even shake with the gun's recoil. Our eye is now the very eye of our fighting airplane. The enemy's picket boats and supply ships offshore are thoroughly strafed. No longer will these craft bring rice and sake and munitions to Marcus. Our bombers flying higher see the island beginning to burn. A moment ago, it looked like a little jade trinket, a cobalt sea. As the fighters and bombers swing victoriously away from Marcus Island, towering columns of smoke show the thorough job our boys have done. Back aboard ship, Smokey is tracking the flyers with care to be sure that none is missing and that no enemy planes are trying to follow them out to our fighting lady. As our planes come aboard, there begins an operation almost as exciting as the attack itself. A ballet after battle, the plane directors as dancing masters. The whirling propellers fill this scene with danger, but now our crews are trained and adept. Landing signal officer performs an eloquent adagio on the fighting lady's stern. Warning to the rest of the cast to stay off stage until a limping member can be led out of the way. Pilots go below to report to their combat intelligence officers. They have hot news, good news. They tell what they saw and did, how many rounds of ammunition they fired, how many bombs they dropped, what they hit, what they noticed at the target that was new and different or that may need hitting again. As the reports are added up and our combat photographers develop their pictures, the story becomes better and better. Every single Jap bomber on Marcus has been destroyed. 80% of the shore installations blasted or set afire. Hangars, radio stations, gas dumps, ammunition dumps. Marcus is now a lovely mess. In the radio plot, Smokey is worried. There are planes still up there and he's wondering about them. They are ours though, delayed by battle damage. Landing a shot-up plane on the carrier is a crucial test of how well-trained, how alert, and steady a naval flyer is. The 
fighting lady now has met her enemy. In the wardroom, the pilots who this morning felt new and nervous now talk like veterans. We have been baptized by fire and have survived nicely. We of the fighting lady are growing up. The admiral of our task force knows the overall strategy of the whole Pacific campaign. To smash straight through Japan's outer network of islands, to recapture the Philippines and land on the mainland of Asia. Thus we will deny Japan supplies from Malaya and the Dutch East Indies and leave her far-flung island garrisons marooned. Then we will reach out and really help our ally China. Months after Marcus, this campaign is well started. Our carrier task forces have been in many battles. And now, early in 1944, the fighting lady's target is Kwajalein, the Marshall Islands. These are Jap Zeros, fighter screen being fierced by our planes and planes from eight other carriers, preparatory to strafing Kwajalein and bombing it up hard. Our fighter pilots have improved with practice, with the confidence that comes from experience. They estimate their range by watching their tracers. They hold their fire until their wing gun bullets converge at 300 yards. They shoot in bursts instead of in steady streams, which heat up the guns and spend ammunition. soon have Kwajalein burning, very satisfactorily. After our bombing attacks and heavy shelling by our surface ships, assault craft filled with Marines and Army hit the beaches. And very soon after that, Kwajalein is ours. Right after Kwajalein, word comes to our admiral that a truck, Japan's huge and secret naval fortress 1,400 miles to the west, there apparently are some heavy units of the Japanese battle fleet. Perhaps we can surprise them. Again, the fighting ladies' squadron and squadrons from other carriers take off for combat. And a lot of mouths are dry at the thought that our target is mighty truck. The rear seat gunners look back at the fighting lady, wondering when and if they will ever return to her. All that we know about truck, we know from a few photographs taken by some nervy marines on reconnaissance just 18 days ago. We hear that it is a complex of heavily fortified islands surrounded by airstrips with naval anchorages at certain spots among the islands. For the next two days, more than 1,000 of our carrier-based planes are going to sweep in on truck in relays. The planes appear to float gently off our bow. Actually, their airspeed is a good 70 knots. Diving in on truck, we again turn on our guns and their synchronized cameras. Truck's defenders are aloft and we smack them hard. Hearts that were in men's mouths before this strike began now settle back into place and are singing once more. 
There's something really grand, something historic about diving in here on this place which Japan has been building and guarding jealously from all the Japanese eyes for 20 years. We dive right in low and take a good look at fighter strips, bomber bases, and seaplane ramps. In an almost vertical dive, the pilot may black out or go blind for a moment when he pulls up and out at the bottom. But the camera won't black out. It cannot see the landing of our own bomb, for we'll be up and away before that reaches the target. But it records the hits of other planes ahead of us. hope to find the Jap fleet here, but most of it's gone. Some lingering ships, including some of their fast fleet tankers, we find hiding in sheltered coves. The vessels which we are now strafing are other fleet auxiliaries, rice boats, transports, and ammunition ships. With bursts of 50 caliber incendiaries and armor-piercing slugs, we set them on fire, rip them open often wide enough to sink. Strafing ships filled with TNT is not very healthy for pilots who dive too low. But it's hard to tell who's carrying what until the big bang comes. Returning to the deck at 130 miles an hour with a flap shot away, all a pilot can hope to save is his own skin. Here comes our new air group commander. He's had a bit of trouble. His windshield is blotted with blood and he has to feel his way aboard. Strafing at low altitude, he took a 40 millimeter anti-aircraft burst right in the face. More than 200 wounds and his plane a sieve. He'll live to fly again. Some planes will not return, but Others come back and land somehow, anyhow. Considering the toughness of truck, our losses are astonishingly light. It's a long way from truck to our secret rendezvous in the Marshall Islands. Someday it can be told just where this is. Actually, it is a magnificent new fleet anchorage, an advanced naval base, which we have taken from the Japs and made secure. Now, for the first time, we, who have been operating as separate, relatively small task forces, see assembled the enormous mass of naval power. Over one million tons of American fighting steel. New carriers, new battleships, new cruisers and fleet auxiliaries in an amount which Japan could never conceive, let alone produce. That we are able to maintain supply lines over the vast distances of the Pacific is one of the miracles of this war. In the comforting presence of so much power, we relax and refresh our battle-strained nerves. Push my head on you. Hey, Benny, when are you going to die? You thought you'd have swam, hey? Benny. <laughs> 
Our ship's post office now does really big business. Letters for us at last from home. Letters from us to friends and families. Our sensors know our collective mood, our central hopes and thoughts. The stuff is really getting out here now. I can't tell you much about it, but oh boy. And the more we get, well, the sooner I'll be seeing you. All hands are called together. Our old skipper, Jocko, has been promoted admiral. Our new one's name is Dixie. Men, as soon as I finish talking, we are getting underway. Our fighting lady is now part of what is designated Task Force 58. As you know, our final destination is a place called Tokyo. We'll have to fight hard to get there, but when we drop our hook at Yokohama, I'm going to throw a party. All hands are cordially invited. Our task forces are built compactly now around carriers like ourselves with speedy new battle wagons at our side. A carrier skipper never leaves the bridge at sea because carriers and their planes are the first to strike the enemy or to be struck by him. Our aircraft pilots are constantly on call for despite the mass of power spread out around us, these are still dangerous waters. Our pilots know this all too well, but it doesn't worry them now for their season. They know how. There are a lot of new faces among us, but most of these men too have been in action. At places like Hollandia, Millie, Joluit, Palau, Rabao, Wake, Meloilap. Our rear seat gunners and radio men are old hands now. Some of their faces are different too because there have been replacements. A lot of them have been made commissioned officers. There's a saying in the Navy that you never learn to love a carrier until she gets hurt. Well, perhaps we don't really love our fighting lady, but we've become mighty fond of her and almost comfortable, almost at home. Occasionally, our shipboard movies bring us that one thing we crave the most, one touch of something utterly American, one deep breath of home. Like Jocko, our new skipper, Dixie, is an old hell-diving Navy pilot. In their battle caps, he and Admiral Mitcher look like big league baseball managers. Northwest we steam, and never before in history has an ocean borne such a weight of naval power. Not a Jutland, not a Japan's proud boast, Tsushima, was there anywhere near the force with which we now assert that this is our ocean. This is our air. We're seeking the Japanese battle fleet to prove it. With our cruisers and our biggest new battle wagons present, we are strong enough to hope, really to hope, that we may provoke the Japanese fleet into accepting a fight. We're joined by plotting Coast Guard and Navy transports. The Marines again. So another amphibious assault is cooking. Uh-oh. Our patrols have spotted an enemy searching plane and are after her. He's a big bird. 20-ton, four-motored Kawanishi seaplane, the kind we call Emily's. Miss Emily's a tough old girl. 
Right now, she's screaming for help and telling Tokyo by radio where we are. Hellcats are closing in on it. So long, Emily. Now that the enemy knows where we are, and we know he knows, our brass hats get together on final arrangements for what may turn into another midway. Our objective, first of many in our drive through to the Philippines and China, will be the Marianas. In battles just ahead of us, we are to make good use of a multitude of weapons, special devices, and techniques which have been evolved through the 30 years since the U.S. Navy first took to the air. Not only did our naval flyers create the aircraft carrier itself, but it was they who devised the torpedo plane and invented and perfected dive bombing. Disposed about our flight deck so that planes can be quickly armed are all manner of death-dealing objects. 500, 1,000, and 2,000 pound bombs. We have torpedoes and incendiaries, and the kind of anti-personnel bombs we call daisy cutters. Some of our bombs are armor-piercing, some for fragmentation. Others have delayed action fuses to prolong the effect of our bombardment for hours after we have delivered it. Here are the new rockets which pack the same wallop as a three-inch shell. They weigh little and because there isn't much recoil, they can be fired from planes. On the eve of battle, we are told to scrub up to lessen the danger of infection in case we're wounded. As well as our bodies, most of us prepare our souls. Always on the eve of battle, divine services are held in relays so that every one of our fighting ladies 3,000 sons has a chance to attend. As the eve before battle lengthens, there is the usual waiting. Again, we're reminded that war is mostly waiting. Because all cooks and bakers must soon be at their battle stations, they work all night long preparing a hearty meal of steak eggs for our 3 a.m. battle breakfast. We are being attacked. We are being attacked by Japanese torpedo planes skimming in after us wing to water. All they want is one hit on our flight deck. We have nearly 90 planes fueled and loaded with bombs ready for the takeoff. Each patch of flame is a burning jack.
In this surprise attack, 19 Japs are polished off by our ship's batteries. Not a single carrier is hit. We have been fortunate. So now commences another major moment in the fighting lady's career. Flight quarters sounds. In this modern warfare, the young plane captains are to their pilots what squires were to armored knights of old. In this operation, typical of many more to come, a lot of other fighting ladies will be involved. Nearly 2,000 carrier-based planes, all of them attacking in air groups like our own. As our Navy makes progressively bigger attacks nearer and nearer the heart of Japan. At his post and radio plot, tracking down enemy planes and cursing the luck that keeps him out of the air, Smokey chafes at being grounded on a day like this, especially when targets are juicy ones. All the Jap air bases and military installations in the Marianas and a special prize package, Guam, the island which we did not fortify, but the Japs did. Now comes word that the Japs have sent strong air reinforcements to Tinian, which flanks Guam. Again, our synchronized cameras record, as no human eye and memory could record, just what our guns and bombs do to the enemy. These pictures enable our air combat intelligence officers to assess the damage as we swoop down upon Tinian. While our planes return for more fuel and ammunition, the surface vessels take over. A prodigious naval barrage to prepare the beaches our assault forces are going to hit. Not only our newest, but some of our oldest and proudest battleships are here. The Colorado, the Tennessee, and the USS Pennsylvania, flagship of World War I. Bringing home to the fighting lady, several of our planes, crippled, make a game attempt to land. Now is when the landing signal officer must judge not only the speed, but estimate the battle damage of planes like these. And flight deck emergency crews firefighters, rescue details, and medical corpsmen exhibit almost incredible courage. The pilot of a torpedo plane has been unable to release his load of incendiaries. Burning thermite is spilling out at incandescent heat. In the plane's tanks remain about 75 gallons of high-octane gas. The 
men who brave this danger to save pilot and crew deserve every citation they get. In the ready rooms, intelligence officers question battle-weary pilots. What did you see? Any Jap carriers in sight? Are you sure they were carrier-based planes? Then from radio plot comes uncomfortable news. Torpedo planes and dive bombers from enemy aircraft carriers are approaching. All hands, man your battle stations. To our engine room go orders for flank speed which is a few knots faster than full speed, in case we need to take evasive action. All boilers are lighted to let the fighting lady outdo herself if necessary. The engine room people turn on the heat, and the propeller shafts churn like fate in their alleys. The fighting lady leaps through the sea on her guard. Skipper Dixie gears himself for action, and so does wise old Scrappy. And now, here they come. Jap Jill, torpedo bomber, miraculously keeps coming through our wall of flak. He's approaching us fast with a life that must be charmed. Our gunners throw everything they've got, but still she comes. His release gear jammed. When Smokey, the pride of Arkansas, hears about that one, he almost takes off. Now our reconnaissance has spotted the Japanese task forces. This is the moment we've been fighting and praying for. Every plane that can fly and every qualified pilot is ordered into the air. At last, Smokey gets his chance to fly again. Pilots, man your planes. Pilots, man your planes. Philippine trade wind is tearing down our flight deck. Our planes strain forward to rise into it. Our entire air group thunders out behind the group commander. Now our fighters run into a slip Jap fighters, mostly Zeros, sent up to intercept our attack on the Japanese fleet. A mad aerial scramble begins which the boys to this day still call the Mariana's turkey shoot. 369 Jap planes are shot down in this single day to our loss of 22. Japanese plane makers have sacrificed strength and firepower for agility. Their planes disintegrate quickly when you hit them. They have no armor plate as ours have, nor are their gas tanks self-sealing. These little monkeys are fancy flyers. They think aerobatics can win dog fights, whereas we believe in smooth flying and careful shooting.
And now, at last, through a late afternoon haze from high altitude, our air combat group sights the Imperial Japanese battle fleet. These are the first pictures ever taken of a great enemy naval formation like this. There it is, that Imperial fleet, crawling around below us in violent evasive action. Us looking down on them in the seas they think they own. Some of these Japanese ships are scampering away at better than 40 knots. When you bore straight down on them, they twist, squirm. Engage a big destroyer at the bow, hoping to shoot out his bridge. He shoots back plenty. Let's go down after that cruiser. He answers us emphatically from the forward turret. Now a 25,000 ton Jap carrier of the Hayataka class is going to get it. Watch five o'clock in the camera, the lower right hand corner of the screen. This big flat top gets it where the turkey got the axe. Touch off some of these babies. Just watch this one. And now we come home from the Battle of the Philippine Sea. 17 Jap warships have been sunk or severely damaged. Several of our returning planes have been badly shot. This pilot has 73 holes in his plane and his leg almost shot away. To clear the deck, He steps out of it, smart. And now it is time to paint up the scores. On this fine morning, just a year after being commissioned, the fighting lady is beginning to look like a stamp album. She has done her share, amassing Task Force 58's grand total of 757 Jap aircraft destroyed in a two-week turkey shoot. But there's another score to add up. Our own casualties. Quite a few faces are no longer with us on the fighting lady. Among them, Commander Upson, skipper of our torpedo squadron. Lieutenant Pappy Condit. Lieutenant John Meehan. And that fightingest gentleman, Lieutenant Smokey Stover. Yes, Smokey's missing too. Salute them under their country's flag. For well, they were brave. They were gallant. Others will come forward to take their places. For the battles we have fought on the seas and in the sky are only the beginning. Still hungry for battle will steam our carrier. Serene, powerful, unafraid. She and her planes will come home again someday, God grant, but not until the bitter, glorious end. For she is, and we salute her, the fighting lady. Mm -hmm.